Hi, welcome back to the Reload Bench. So here it is, the Scary Evil Black Rifle. You know, the one that can shoot down airliners and shoot through armor plate and only criminals use. It's got a lot of bad press. There are a lot of ignorant people out there in politics and the media that are pushing their agenda to take away your right to be able to own this. And there are lots, lots of people out there who believe that stuff. Or for lots of people, it's a non-issue. But now that we've got a national emergency and people are scared, People are scared law enforcement won't show up. People are scared that the government might take over. People are scared that somebody might kick in their door to take their toilet paper. Suddenly things like this, maybe they're not so scary. They're not so evil. So there's lots of new gun owners out there that have decided to get one of these as their first weapon. And I think that's a good choice, not just from the home defense standpoint, but because this is such a good platform to learn on. You can learn Firearm safety. You can learn a, a lot about cleaning, a little bit of gunsmithing, marksmanship. This is an excellent platform to learn on. And there's some of you out there that guns are not a new thing to you, but you've never had a need for one of these things. You just couldn't fit it into whatever it is you do with guns, or you you just didn't like it. You know, it's, it's not it's not it doesn't fit in with your hunting rifles or whatever it, it, it is that about it that you just never liked. But now suddenly you're there looking at going, yeah, I kind of need something that's a little bit more geared towards home defense. So there are people out there who have these for the first time. They're a little bit late to the game, and some of them aren't really sure what what they're doing with it. They, they're, they're not really sure how to use it. They're not really sure how to field strip it and clean it. And they're not really sure about what they want to change on it because this is a modular system. You can change anything on this gun pretty much to customize it to fit you, to fit where you live, to fit the laws in your state, to fit the primary purpose that you're going to be using this for. You can uh, adjust this to fit your stature. Whatever it is that, that, that you want to customize on this gun, you can customize. So there's lots of parts out there that are available aftermarket so that if you buy the firearm complete and you don't like something on it or later on down the road something changes, you can change the gun. In addition to that, you can buy these partially built and put them together, or you can buy them completely bare and assemble them, build them from scratch. And in that process, you can customize it and make it your own. That is that is the way that I, I prefer to have these rifles, either partially built and put them together. And at some point, I would like to have a complete bare upper and bare lower and build one myself from scratch. Because... In that process, you learn a lot about the platform. It's going to help you with your gunsmithing skills. And you can make it your own right off the get-go. And you don't have to buy it and then spend money to replace parts on it that are already there that you don't like. Now, for newbies, they don't know what they like, what they don't like. They hear that this A2 grip is bad. They hear that these GI handguards are bad. You know, they, they hear all kinds of things about this platform, in addition to all the lies the media put out there. So there's a lot of bad information. Some of this you're going to have to find out on your own as you go along. This video is about what spare parts, stock spare parts, I think you should keep if you have a 5.56 NATO version in a rifle or carbine length. This isn't for different calibers. This isn't for pistol caliber carbines. This isn't for AR-10s. And I suppose you could use this for a short barrel rifle if you want to go to the expense and trouble of getting a tax stamp and all that waiting and all that rigmarole to, to get an SBR version. Or for a, a pistol version in 5.56 NATO, this could also apply to you. So let me get to the video and let me show you some of the things that I've done as far as keeping spare parts and the spare parts that I think that you could use the most for this platform in 5.56 NATO. So there's a lot of hate out there for the A2 grip. You may take it off of your brand new rifle because uh, you heard something on the internet. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that just don't like these. I don't have a problem with them. I'm not saying you have to keep it on there, but there are a lot of grip options. Just hold on to it. You might have a use for it in the future or just, you know, you'll, you'll build up a collection of these in your boxes of spare parts. You can order little things like this. This is an oops kit. There are a lot of different manufacturers that sell oops kits. Oops meaning when I assembled from a bare receiver, I lost a part. 
this isn't really meant to be a replacement parts kit for a completed rifle that breaks down and you need a spare part. A lot of these parts get lost if you take the rifle down to a frame. And for regular field stripping and cleaning, you don't do that. So this may be a waste of money for you unless you're assembling a rifle from scratch or almost from scratch. And that just might be a misconception that's out there. Other little parts are available. Armaspec isn't the only company out there that sells these. There are lots of different companies out there. This is just one of the companies I prefer. Here's little detents and springs. These, these ride in little channels, like right in here. And people lose these all the time. But once again, that's during assembly. When you field strip this thing, you're not you're not taking it down to this. You, you, if you take it down to this to clean it, you're you're not following directions. Okay. So once again, these are great to keep as spare parts, or they're great replacements if something did wear out. I had one of these springs. I had a stock come loose after about 19 years and bent one of these springs. I mean, you really just don't have a need for that sort of thing. And you can see here. Here's my little. Parts, parts organizer that I bought 20 years ago, right? I even put a label on it so I know what's in there. And there's leftover parts from the very first time I built an AR-15. Parts I bought at gun shows when I was a teenager before I ever had one of these. Look, replacement magazine springs, followers. I mean, here we go. I've got a mag release. I've got a bolt catch. I've got all these extra little parts and pieces here. When I've ordered, when I've ordered stuff online, maybe I'll throw on a couple, you know, a little 99 cent, $3 parts, things like that. Look, here's simple cotter pin. This is one of the parts that is going to be one of the easiest ones for you to lose. And, uh, you know, I heard somebody say, don't just buy one of these for three bucks and then pay $20 shipping. And there is some, some truth to that. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Don't, don't pay $23 for a $3 part. But how hard is it to throw a couple of these on an order with a box of ammunition from Brownells, right? I mean, look, I've got some leftover forward assists. Tons and tons of parts. Look, I've even got an old flash hider I bought back in the 80s. Oh, my goodness. So, you can get organized like this if you want, but for me, this is really more uh, of a way to, to store uh, leftover parts. Okay, now the meat and potatoes. What is the part on a stock 5.56 NATO AR-15 carbine or rifle that is most likely to fail? This. This is the part that's most likely to fail. Your bolt, your bolt carrier group. Out of all the parts that I've had to deal with, I have not had a trigger spring fail unless I've improperly installed it. I've had different parts plug up, like a gas tube plug up or things like that. And eventually parts will wear out. I'm not talking about uh, failure over thousands of rounds or over time. Any of the pieces can break. But... This is your, in, in my experience, this is your point of failure, whether it be on a semi-auto or a select fire rifle. And a lot of people have difficulty with these when they're newbies. But I'm telling you what, this is, there's nothing to this, okay? So this is your bolt carrier group, and it is your bolt, all right? All you do is pop out the key. You say, well, I need a special tool to do that. Yeah, here's your special tool. Q-tip. Not an ordinary Q-tip that you buy at the store. These are Q-tips with a six-inch balsa wood stem on them. I buy these on Amazon, but there's other places you can get them. This is what we used in the military to clean them, not Q-tips from the store. That's not to say that I don't use Q-tips from the store. For close-in areas or where I don't want to spend the money, these are a lot cheaper than these, but these are not expensive. So, using the tool that I'm going to have for cleaning... I can, look at that, pop out the cotter pin. Any of the parts on your new gun are going to take some time to wear in, okay? There's no recommendation I've ever heard of how many rounds before this, that, and the other. But the more you take it apart and clean it, the more it's going to wear in. I've seen people try to take off the military-style handguards, and they have such trouble. They've got to use a tool. 
if you take them off and 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 clean that barrel every time that you you field strip the rifle, in no time that delta ring will will work. It'll still have enough tension to hold the hand guards, but it, it won't be as much effort. It just it it takes a while. Putting this cotter pin in. If it doesn't go in, give it a little twist. Just work it a little bit. After a while, it will go in. Amazing. So, pop our pin out. Drop our firing pin. If you want to keep a spare firing pin, keep a spare firing pin. I recommend a stock pin. They do sell titanium pins. I've heard things about the titanium pins. I've never actually used one. I've never really had an issue with a stock pin. The cam pin kind of creates some trouble for some people. Once you get the firing pin out, it'll just spin around. And it's not easy to get this in the shop without blocking it. But it will come free. Just have to work it. After a while, it'll just pop right out. Bolt comes right out. You say, all right, that's it, right? You can just clean the bolt. You may have to run a uh, pipe cleaner down there. Okay, you can just clean the bolt, but there is an additional step here. So you can take the bolt down further than just this. You can take a pipe cleaner and get in there and get in here and clean. But you can go ahead and take the extractor out once again with the Q-tip. It is. There's a little pin there. Pops right out. There's your extractor. So with the bolt completely disassembled, and you could say, well, what about the ejector right here? See this little metal thing sticking out? It's spring-loaded. That's the ejector. And I just broke my Q-tip. Spring-loaded. Okay, that's the ejector. You may want to get a replacement spring and pin for this but you should really never have to take this out and take this down really the extractor here has a spring in here there is a chance you could lose the spring or break the spring you've got your cotter pin which is your firing pin retaining pin and then you've got your extractor pin which is this little dowel here so spring in there this little cotter pin, that little dowel pin. Those are the three parts that I recommend that you keep. That and some Q-tips like that. That's really it. Now, if you want to get an entire spare bolt, that's a great idea. A spare bolt carrier group, the, the bolt and the bolt carrier, that's a great idea. If you want a spare firing pin, cam, hey, that's all good. If that's what you want to do, it's no problem with that. More is better. And you may end up having it a, a, a time in the future where you decide that you want to build another AR or assemble another AR. And having these already, instead of having to pay for them, is kind of nice. Because sometimes you'll get an upper that does not come with a bolt carrier group. And see, I'm just using this simple wood stem on this Q-tip. Come on. It's because it's new. When it breaks in, it's a lot easier. But, I mean, there's nothing to it. There we go. Pushed it through too far. Get it just right. Do it by hand. There we go. All right. So, go ahead and drop that in. There we go. Goes in. Look at that. Nothing to it. Line up that oval hole. Get this in there. All right. Line up just right. How about if I spin it around the right way? There we go. Look at that. I can turn it. Pull the bolt forward. Drop the firing pin in there. Let gravity do the work. Put in the retaining pin. Look at that. Just went in with my thumb. Look at that. 
Once it gets loose enough, you should be able to flick it. There you go. Oh, it's all on the wrist. See? Nothing to it. So those three little pieces and some simple Q-tips are really what I would recommend you have if you've got a 5.56 NATO carbine or rifle length AR-15. Anything else really is unnecessary, but that doesn't mean that at a later point you might not be changing out some parts. It's just really up to you. So it's really more of a, a budget-minded thing or how much storage space do I have. If you want to start picking up parts for it, like I said before, if you're already ordering something from Midway USA or Graf & Sons or Brownells or Armalite or Delton or Anderson or Armaspec, or the list goes on and on, just throw a couple little things on there. It's only going to raise the shipping a few cents. Before you know it, you've got a tackle box full of spare parts. Thanks for watching.